Good afternoon. Wow. It's, it's wonderful to see you and be here. I'm Sophia Bracey Harris, <laughs> a local. And I am delighted to introduce two people who have been very, very important in my life. This is an opportunity that Brian Stevenson and Equal Justice Initiative have given us for truth telling. And as a 15 year old who was among the first to integrate high schools in Elmore County, not far from here, and had the terror of having our home firebombed at 1 a.m. in the morning, I think that this whole experience, these past days and, and the days to come, is an opportunity for us to share those experiences, but most importantly, to share the courage that is needed to tell the truth. Marion White Elderman, born in Venetsville, South Carolina, graduate of Spelman College, Yale Law School, the first black woman to pass the bar in Mississippi. <laughs> Instrumental in Head Start, which has become a common word but if you think back some 50 years ago, we didn't have opportunities for the education of young children. And coming out of 1964 and that summer in Mississippi, Marion was a very important part of that. But most importantly, in 1973, with the formation of the Children's Defense Fund, Marion became my mentor, a young girl that had just gone ahead and graduated from Auburn University and had become a founding person, a part of the Federation of Child Care Centers of Alabama, which for 43 years worked with helping families to love, to nurture, to educate our children in ways that they had not been educated before and could not be educated before. And after that, and after that experience, I also, being a young adult, began to discover what it was like to be a woman. Because there were times telling the truth, being a woman was not popular. In fact, in fact, we often said, and I remember saying, oh, I'm much better friends with guys than I am with women. But I met a, per a person who helped me to shape my identity and recognize that there were parts of me that I had bought into that said I was not okay because of my gender. Gloria Steinem, founder of the Ms. Foundation for Women, a feminist, a journalist, a person who has spent her life telling the truth, whether it was from the welfare rights organizing with Ruby Duncan over in Las Vegas, Nevada, or whether it was here in Alabama and the two trips she made here trying to help the women who were running childcare programs to find funding to do what they needed to do. Gloria, as I served with them on the Ms. Foundation's board, was a gentle soul, but a fierce, fierce advocate and fighter. And Gloria still is telling the truth in her writings, in her work, in her advocacy. And this event is made the better for two women 
who have spent their lifetime and have been vanguards for telling the truth for children and the significance of our teaching children to love, teaching children to appreciate who they are, as well as for the mothers and the women and the individuals who are shaping their lives. I am delighted to, to introduce to you and present to you Marion Wright Elderman and Gloria Steinem. Thank you. speak for all of us, if I may, I'll elect myself to say icons, legends, uh, role models, we, there, there, is, there are no words to thank you both for all that you have done. So let us start by saying we thank you. And I want to start a little bit because we have one of the things that's wonderful about this audience is that, and my name is Michelle Martin, by the way, for I was <laughs> delighted to be with you. And the weekend host of All Things Considered at NPR, I've done it, write the check, thank you, we appreciate it. Um, I think a lot of us would appreciate knowing why you do what you do. So why don't we start with that? Why do you do Me? what you do? Gloria, why don't you start, and then Mrs. Edelman will go next. Uh, well. First, I have to apologize for my voice. I don't always sound like this. <laughs> um, I do it I, because I feel blessed to do what I love all the time. And I think, you know, I have a kind of feeling that if we didn't discipline children, I'm so glad Marion's here because I think children are the key to everything, uh, that, you know, how little kids say, it's not fair, you are not the boss of me. <laughs> I think that I managed to preserve that a little bit longer maybe because, because I didn't go to school very much until I was about 12 or so and so I missed a certain amount of brainwashing. <laughs> um, and then I did spend some time rebelling and hoping no one would notice, but the purpose of social justice movements is to give us companionship and company. So by the time I was in my late 30s, I realized that this is what I wanted to do, first as a journalist, but then once you write about something, you kind of can't not, you can't resist doing something about it too. So I became a journalist and an organizer. And as I say, I feel lucky I get to do what I love all the time. It's frustrating, it's angering, it's everything we know, but it makes, it, it just is irresistible. Well, I do what I do because my parents and my community co-parents did what they did. And children do what adults do, not what we tell them mm -hmm. to do. And even though I grew up in a small, segregated South Carolina town, I always knew that God made, did not make two classes of children. And while it was segregated, I was a rebel from a very early age, whether it was changing white and black signs in Belk's department store that said there was black, whatever, um, or trying to go into the public library that was not for us, um, and, or making sure that we had our share of the sidewalk as white children went this way and we went that way. But the messages of my childhood were very clear. If you don't like the way things are, you figure out how to change them. Don't ask why somebody doesn't do something. Secondly, follow the need. When old man Reddick had Alzheimer's, which we didn't know that term back then, and was wandering the streets, you know, he didn't have where to go. And my dad and mama started a home for the aged across the street from our church. My daddy was 
was a pre preacher and my mama was a church organizer and organist and could do anything. Um, and we started this home for the aged and all of us children had to cook and clean. I sure didn't like it at the time. But that's how I learned that elderly neighbors were our neighbors and we were responsible. Everything that the Children's Defense Fund works on today came out of my childhood experiences. The migrant family who collided with a white truck driver in front of our church highway in the middle of the night. We all ran out to see what we could do. Um, the truck driver wasn't hurt. The ambulance came, the migrant family was hurt very badly, but they drove away when they saw that the white truck driver wasn't hurt. I never forgot that. And I'm obsessed with health care for everybody. And um, every time. <laughs> Little Johnny Harrington, who lived two houses down from me, stepped on a nail, he lived with his grandma Ruth, got tetanus, but nobody knew about tetanus shots, so I am a bear about immunizations for every child because of little Johnny Harrington. We lived near the creek, Crooked Creek, near our church. And all the black people swam and fished in that creek. My friend, not too, long, not too far away from my home, jumped off the creek diving, broke his neck, died. But then I later learned that the place where we, they swam, and that we fished as people um, was a hospital sewage outlet. Can you imagine? Um, you know, and so I've never forgotten that. Uh, but more importantly, the bottom line was, if you see a need, don't, let, don't ask why doesn't somebody do something, ask why don't you do it? And so I do what my parents did, what my community parents did, and we were owned by that community. If I was someplace I wasn't supposed to be, boy, they knew about it. And while it is, it, it, the, the sense of community and the love which I had as a child growing up, there was never a time when I didn't believe I was gonna to try to change the world. If you didn't like it, change it. And that's our mandate today. We gotta to change this country and change this world and we can do it. <laughs> what, about, what about, what about people who aren't being taught that? I'm curious about that. I mean, there are people who are being taught, you know, get yours first no matter what you do. And Gloria, I'm gonna start with you on this because you didn't have the easiest upbringing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were, I hope you don't mind my sharing this. I think people know that your mother was mentally ill and you were her caretaker for much of your childhood. So you didn't have it easy. And I'm curious about a couple of things is that um, it would have been easy and one that would easily have understood if after having had that experience, your, your view of it was get mine, me first and y'all can take care of yourselves, because I've done my caring about other people. So I'm curious about why you think you didn't. And then I want to expand it to say, well, what about people who weren't taught to care about other people? Is, is that something that can be taught? <clears throat> I did uh, get uh, caring and a certain degree of activism from my parents. Uh, you know, if you said the word Roosevelt to my mother, tears came to her eyes because he got us out of the Depression and how poor we were in the Depression. Uh, but I didn't have those kind of role models, it's true, they were not activists in the same way. And it took me a while to realize that what had happened to my mother, because she was treated as mentally ill and she had got addicted to an early form of tranquilizer and so on. But after she had been in a mental hospital for a couple of years and I asked the doctor what his diagnosis was, she, he said she had anxiety neurosis. And I said to him, would you say her spirit had been broken? And he said, yes. Because I had learned by then that long before I was born, my mother had been a pioneer newspaper woman writing under a man's name to get published, then ultimately becoming Sunday editor of a newspaper in Toledo, Ohio, which must have been enormous, you know, in, in her time. She had my older sister, who's nine years older. Uh, she was married to my father, who is a wonderful, loving, completely irresponsible human being. <laughs> so she was <clears throat> having a hard time. <clears throat> sorry about the laryngitis, I'm sorry. Um, she just couldn't make it all work. There was just too much against her. She had a nerve, what was then called a nervous breakdown, and she was in a hospital for a couple of years. This was all before I was born. It took me a while to discover that, but once I discovered that, I 
I just was in mourning for who she could have been. And I think it's not unusual for a lot of us with our mothers especially, but maybe fathers too, to, that, that we are living the unlived lives of our parents. So I feel, you know, that was my lesson, if it, not the same as watching it happen, but watching it not happen and what the cost was. Mm -hmm. Mary, do you feel that the courage, can courage, the courage to change things be taught or do you think it's something that's just in you? It can be taught by example. Mm -hmm. Children don't do what we tell them to do, but they always do what we do. And they watch. And one of the things that was so wonderful again in my childhood, because it was a poor community, is that we had community co-parents. If we went and did something, everybody in the community felt, <coughs> you know, obligated to make sure they reported on us. I had 12 foster sisters and brothers. I would wake up, there would be a new child <laughs> in my house. And I, you know, and, and, and when old man Reddick got Alzheimer's and with daddy, then mama started a house and we all had to cop it, stop and clean and go over there and take food. We didn't like it at the time, but that's how we learned that everybody was our neighbor. And we had community people that I just loved. It didn't have any children, but where I would stay with when my parents left um, and they would look out for us. I mean, we were a community property. And the teachers in our community, um, you know, Many of them came from other places and had to live in, 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 in our little hometown. But they were more than teachers. They became our Girl Scout troop leader or our Boy Scout troop leader. And while the schools were separate and unequal, we always had books in the home, okay? We, even if we didn't have a second pair of shoes. But more importantly, every morning we sang the Negro National Anthem in our black public school. And so we knew about that. We had oratorical contests, which we are now trying to reinstitute in our freedom schools at the Children's Defense Fund. And I can remember Ralph Bunch's speech at Fisk University's commencement in 1946 that says the barriers of race can be surmounted. If there was a famous person like Mr. Bethune or, you know, or Mordecai Johnson, who I used to hate because he used to speech for three and a half hours with an intermission in Columbia on the hardest chairs you ever did see, but they would take us to hear great speakers. And the first time I met Miss Bethune at Benedict, the first time I heard the word, the, the black of the berry, the sweet of the use, uh, the, the sweet of the juice. I never heard a black woman command a group of men the way she did. And she would regale these stories about how she would, you know, challenge segregation, saying, I am Mary McLeod Bethune. I will try on this hat in your white hat shop. And so it was really, it was wonderful. But we were always exposed. And so I just think we need to get back to making sure the children know their rich heritage. While we can have separate and unequal schools, we can know what our great heritage was. Langston Hughes came to my hometown. And by mistake, he was going to Atlanta University. Um, he was going to Atlanta University, and somebody had given him the name of a white minister 15 miles away from us in Chiraw, South Carolina, and we lived on Chiraw Highway. But that white minister saw Langston Hughes stand at his door saying, your friend sent me from Harlem to stay with you. He panicked, put him in the car, drove him to my hometown, and sent, went to the principal's office and left him there, the black principal's office. And when the principal's wife came in and saw him, she didn't believe it. She said, you can't be who I think you are. He said, yes, I am, and I'm staying at your house tonight. Uh, um, but he said he had, to, and she said, would you come and talk to my children? And he said, I can't stay in the morning. I'm on my way to Atlanta University, and my train leaves at X time, and I'll, but I'll come back. And he came back to Little Bennettsville, South Carolina, and he read to us. And I just, th this exposure, you know, through oratorical contests, and that's what we're trying to do in freedom schools. They need to know their rich heritage and what they have come through, and they've got so much to draw on. And so I'm just very grateful. So let's broaden it out, because one of the things that distinguishes both of your careers is that you each are of a time and a place, and you had a specific focus and mission, but over time, each of you has broadened your mission to include people who don't look like you, people who don't share your histories and, and backgrounds. You know, there's, a, there's a, a, a nice word that we use these days called intersectionality, which is a good word. It's a lot of, it's a big SAT word. But um, if they still have, did they still do that SAT? Um, thankfully. Um, but I'd like to understand now, do you have a theory of everything? 
that informs your sense of where justice comes from, where, no, you don't, you, yeah. If Gloria says yes, you say no. Just, okay, good, tension. Let's hear it. I was just it. saying okay, that let's hear it. nobody has ever asked me that question before. It's really dangerous because I kind of do have <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> And I think it started uh, because I lived in India for a couple of years right after I graduated and it was so clear that the uh, Kerala, the southernmost part, which is matrilineal and much more egalitarian, and you, you know, you you could see the connection between control, between caste, as race here, and uh, the status of women, because in order to maintain visible difference or racial purity, whatever that means, or, you know, difference at all, you have to control reproduction. And that means you have to control the bodies of women. So it was always kind of clear to me from there, from living in India and then seeing it at home, that these two things are intertwined, that you can't actually uproot racism without also uprooting sexism in the long run. And, and <clears throat> that though, <clears throat> that though women are, you know, I mean, white women are more likely to be sexually restricted in order to keep the race pure, whatever that may mean, distinct. Black women are more likely to be sexually exploited. It doesn't mean that you experience exactly the same thing, but it does mean that you can't perpetuate racism without sexism. And that sexism is made, uh, you know, just, inevitable by racism. So there's no such thing as fighting one thing without fighting the other. Mm -hmm. But Mary, what about you? Well, actually, Gloria, let me stick with you for one second because, it, because everybody within each movement has not always agreed with you. I mean, I think everybody knows by now that some of the early pioneers of reproductive freedom were also thoroughgoing racists, I think, or eugenicists. They were, it, it's just a fact. So I'm just curious mm -hmm. within your own movement. Well, but it was also, argument. I mean, Fannie Lou Hamer was a, a founder of the reproductive justice movement because she spoke to, uh, she spoke out about being sterilized without her knowledge in a hospital she'd entered for other reasons. And she had tried to say that in, to, in a SNCC meeting and, the, you know, had been embarrassed for, for, anyway, they didn't take it up. And it's why she became a founder of the National Women's Political Caucus and you know why she spoke to, I mean, Ruth Ginsburg was then head of the women's issues part of the ACLU and she was trying to do away with uh, the uh, forced sterilization of women and girls because of the welfare, you know, there was a whole, right? So I, I think it's, it's quite clear that they all go together, but it is also true that there is sexism uh, in, various kinds of civil rights movements, and it's also true that there's racism within the women's movement. I mean, you know, we're all living together here. But I, I, I do think that uh, once we look at, at the history of the women's movement, which I'm trying to do together now, with uh, Paula Giddings and Beverly Guy Sheftel are doing this, we're all doing it as a project. We're doing the hidden figures of <laughs> you might say, of the women's movement, that it turns out that black women have always been way, way, way disproportionately uh, the women's movement, per se, always. And w when Ms. Magazine published uh, a, the very first Lewis Harris poll of the uh, women's movement, about the women's movement, then called women's liberation rather than feminism, and all the issues of the women's movement, it, the results, and this was in 1972, were that more than 60% of black women supported uh, women's liberation and all the issues, and only 37% of white women. So the w women's movement has always been disproportionately black women, and we certainly saw that result in, you know, that uh, what, you know, 96% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton and 51% of white married women voted for Trump. So, you know, it's, 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 
the it's the women's movement is presented as white sometimes and the civil rights I mean you know it's presented in that way but it's actually hasn't been factually true in terms of who the activists were Mrs. Edelman was there a con I'm interested in your sort of consciousness about the importance of other movements and peoples I mean it, it, do you remember kind of a, an a eureka moment for you where you saw that the things that concerned you and moved you were also things that were deeply relevant to other people? Do you remember that? My family was a family of readers. Mm -hmm. My daddy was a preacher, but he would spend three or four hours in his study every day reading. Um, I had Carl Sandburg's whole set of Ray Abraham Lincoln on our living room mantel. Um, and, um, and we had discussions all the time. And I just have never forgotten in our church vestibule, there was a picture of a very rich white family around a very lavish Thanksgiving dinner, but with huge numbers of poor brown and black people around. And they said, shall we say blessing? I had certain other clear messages. My mother was, they were an extraordinary partnership. He called her pal. She was the best organizer I know. She was a church organist. She was a church fundraiser. She could do anything. Um, and I went everywhere with my parents. I mean, I was the youngest. I was an accident six years after. My, my brother never forgave me, the one who was the baby when I got born. Um, but I learned to be a good survivor because I was always endangered um, because of that. Um, but the message in our, and most of our public school teachers were women because people made a conscious decision, the black community, they would educate their daughters to, to avoid sexual exploitation of working in other people's houses and their sons could do manual labor. Um, and so I always had these very educated black women around. But what I also loved that it was classless because the ones that I consider my co-mothers were the ordinary women of grace who cooked, who cleaned, who kept me when my parents went out. And so it was a wonderful sense of community, but with a core value that God did not create two classes of people and God did not create two classes of children. And we were community property. And so through reading, and we were lucky to have books um, everywhere, and through the exposure to respect for everybody, because we people, my daddy tried to live this way, their faith. You know, you, 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 you just instinctively kind of do that. I had 12 foster sisters and brothers. Um, and when we made my mother turn over the old folks' home um, in her last years after she was in her late 80s, we found out that everybody in the old folks' home that she was serving three meals a day to were younger than she was. <laughs> and we thought, she always had a sense of purpose. If you see a need, don't ask why somebody does it. See how you can so, do something. Well, what about subsequent movements that have now come to fore, like for the movement for transgender rights, for example, or the movement for LGBT rights? There are people who have been traditional activists who have themselves struggle. I mean, it's, it's not a secret. Sometimes they have struggled. Have you ever struggled? Oh, I always struggle. These are complicated kinds of things, but again, the bottom core, you know, the value that's been built into me is that God did not make two classes of children and everybody should be treated justly. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to work out the policies and work out the politics and the differences. And that major cause may not be somebody else, but if they're a human being. So that's your theory of everything. That's my theory. That's your theory. It should be just to people. Yeah. And the law should first. be fair to people. Okay. <coughs> what about you, Gloria? Have you ever, mm. have you ever sort of struggled to incorporate somebody else's struggle as being similar to your own? Well, I think, um, I mean, I learned you know, because, as I was saying, of the, the oldest cultures in, in India and also the Khoi and the San in Africa, where we all came from, and also Native, a lot of the Native American cultures here did not have he and she in their language. They didn't have a word for gender. Hello? People were people. I mean, how great is that, you know? And they didn't have a word for nature either because we were not separate from, from nature. So, I mean, the idea of race and gender has not always existed. It came along, you know, in different parts of the world in different times uh, with, I mean, once, here's my theory of everything, watch out anyway, oh, <laughs> no, but once patriarchy was established 
uh, more or less in Europe, which, which required the murder of six million witches, who were just health workers for women, over, over 300 years because they enabled women to control reproduction. Um, so once that happened and Europe became overpopulated as a result of forcing women to have children they would not otherwise have had, then they invented racism to justify colonialism. And uh, there's a whole wonderful <laughs> exploration of this in a book called Exterminate All the Brutes by a, a, a Swedish author who's explaining that the whole school of skull measurements to prove the inferiority of some races and the whole theory of racism was literally invented to justify taking over other people's land and continents, you know, and I mean, both in Africa and in North and South America. And it came home as the Holocaust. I mean, what was different about the Holocaust was that it happened in Europe. But the, 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 the idea of, of racial hierarchy and racial inferiority, which is utter bullshit, you know, I mean, total, utter bullshit you know, was, was invented. And somehow I find it comforting to understand that if for most of human history, I mean, the last, it's the last 5,000 years in some parts of the world, it's the last five or 600 here, it's not that long. I was gonna ask you about that, because one of the things that I think s that people notice about both of you is your unending optimism. And that is a quality that defines both of you, even as you continue to kind of rage against the things that deserve to be raged against. And I think a lot of people would be interested, especially in the current moment, of how, how is that possible? Like, how is it that you maintain that mm -hmm. sense of humor, well, that optimism? Well, it isn't as if we what don't get discouraged and angry. <laughs> so, I mean, we, do, I'm sure we do, right? But um, I think hope is a form of planning because if the hopes weren't already real inside you, you couldn't even hope them. So... Say that again, hope is a form of... Planning. Planning. Interesting, okay. I mean, because if we couldn't imagine them, I mean, if we imagine them, they're in us somehow. And it's true that I am a hopeaholic, okay? I, I cop to the fact that I am a hopeaholic. <laughs> but, but they, you know, that's the basis of... of everything. If you know, you can't stop thinking, well, maybe if we did this, that would happen. If we put these people together, the, you know, I mean, it's, I, I can't imagine giving that up. You ever, ne never discouraged? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Are you kidding me? I mean, All we, the time. We, have, <laughs> we have a president who is not a president. Most people didn't vote for him. I couldn't shake hands with this guy. <laughs> but a lot of people did. I mean, a lot of people did. Maybe most didn't, but a lot of people did. A lot of people did. We've so, seen a lot of change. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I grew up in a rigidly segregated town, time when we were separate and unequal, and we're still separate and unequal in many ways. But it's been an enormous amount of change, some thanks to the Civil Rights Movement. And, you know, and, and, and I look at the work for children, I thought I'd be out of business. I just told people, you know, here's the needs of children, here's what it costs you to make them bad or to make them, you know, uneducated or to make them whatever. And I'd be out of business in a few, a few years because of cost effectiveness, you know, it's hard. But the civil rights movement made a huge amount of difference in breaking right. down racial caste and segregation in this country. We still got a lot of way to go, but you know, huge changes. When we look at the women's movement, huge changes. We look at the children's movements, we have got 50 laws on the books that we never would have had. We did it inch by inch and increment by increment. 95% of all children are now covered by Medicaid and CHIP. And we now got a new 10-year extension. We've got an early childhood system that still needs to be perfected, but nevertheless, you know, we're in a very different place. Immunizations are there. There's a whole set of things. And in this last, and the point is, don't ever, you know, do your crime and then get up and try again. You just be mm -hmm. ready for the next battle. And in the worst budget battle, uh, this last budget, this bad budget, we had allies just waiting to put stuff in the basket when they needed to negotiate for a boat. And we came out, not only with the 10 years for CHIP, a doubling of the child care block grant, 
seven billion dollars ain't bad. Um, and a pres family preservation system that's you know is now available to keep children out of foster care and out of homes. Home visiting programs. You just have to sort of keep. It's hard to work the policy process. But the fact is, we're in a very different place on so many different issues that you just have to keep at it and we're going to end child poverty in this country and we are going to end gun violence against children and I really and so, we, so we, you've got all the power you need. Really? Could I write that down, the date? When is that going to be? Because I want to put it in my no, calendar. Right now with this crowd. Okay. Go ahead, well, let me, ask no, this. I, let me ask the folks. Gloria, did you want to add something? No, I just want to say that I think that part of the role of us golden oldies here <laughs> when we're, is that we bring hope because we remember when it was worse. And the role of everybody younger is that you are mad as hell because you know that it's wrong and, up, and we need you to remember to be mad as hell, <laughs> right? But, we, but that's why we need to organize together. And I think age segregation is as bad as any other form of segregation. I was going to ask, and I'm just, you know, be honest here, how many of you are feeling hopeful right now? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. Can I ask how many are not feeling hopeful? Can I see some hands? And the folks that, I'm sorry that we don't have an opportunity. This is a big group and I'm grateful for that. I'm sorry we don't have more of an opportunity to, to talk with you. Um, and those of you, do you mind, if for those of you who are feeling a sense of a lack of hope or I don't wanna say despair, do you, can you just shout out a couple thoughts about why? Why is that? I saw some hands here. Why are you feeling it? The environment, other things. Disparity, other things. Resistance. Say it again. Resistance. Resistance. Yeah. Trump. Got that part. <laughs> um, okay, what about, thank you. What about that? You don't have time for that, okay? <laughs> this is, this is, I went, I took my granddaughters to one of the Selma uh, reunions and I watched everybody come in and celebrate Miss Boynton in her wheelchair. She was a hundred plus years old and they were coming up and say, we stand on your shoulders and she said, get off of my shoulders. <laughs> get off of my shoulders and get out there and build the next past of hope. I mean, there's been enormous change in this country and we're gonna finish that change and I've got an agenda for you. And I, you know, and, and you don't have time to be sort of, I mean, that's, that's very, don't, 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 get okay. out here and do what has to be okay. done. Oh, I think the first thing t-shirt though, there's a t-shirt for EJI, here's your next t-shirt, get off my shoulders. Get off my shoulders. Okay. And build that next path. Build that next path. There are two things here, we've been talking about lynching. The first big movement we've got to really build on, we've got all the police killing children. We have lost between 1963 and 2016, 65,947 black children and teens by guns. That's more than 16 times the number of lynchings of black people of all ages in the 74 years from 1877 to 1950. We have a whole lot more black folk and we have a whole lot more folk than members of the NRA. We need to retire the NRA from gun policy. alternatives to the streets. Open up these church and synagogue and mosque doors and put freedom schools in them so that they are not terrified after school and have nothing but gangs and other things to sort of relate to. We need to get the black adults to become the black adults, the white adults, they need safe spaces. They need to learn about their history. They need to learn how to read and to compute and to stay out of trouble. They're terrified and we need to stop that and we need to begin to make sure that children are safe and they're educated. 80%, over 80% of our black fourth and eighth graders cannot read or compute at grade level. Um, and this, what are you gonna do if you
you can't read at the most basic level. We need to demand that our schools teach our children, but we need to make sure that they have freedom schools, good role models in the summer and after school, have books where they learn their history, learn how to read, have adults who adopt them and care for them. We've got a job to do, and the next thing to do in honoring this great struggle that we celebrated today, and I can't shout out enough to EJI and to, and, and to Brian and to all of who made this possible. But we, but we honor this by making sure that the next anti-lynching movement is to stop gun violence in this country against our children. We need to do that. And secondly, we can, and we are now doing a new study, an update of our study about ways to end child poverty and break up that cradle to prison pipeline. It's so much cheaper to give children prenatal care than to teach them, you know, leave it, than to deal with all the infant mortality, all the sort of cost effectiveness of our child neglect. And so we did a study two, three years ago, they had the Urban Institute do it, to say what would it cost to end child poverty in America? And I tell you, it's a bargain. And it, it's a bargain. And we issued a report which we're going to update now in about a month, and when you get it, you join us and you do something. We found that we could, in laying out nine policies, and housing was the biggest poverty alleviation thing, that we could decrease child poverty overall for all children by 60% and 72% for black children. And it would cost us $77 billion. We had had a Nobel laureate economist show us that every year we let all these children drop out of school and stay in poverty, it cost us a half trillion dollars out of, you know, every year. And so we said, good Lord, why can we not save all this money and save our children? We're gonna be issuing this report in a month, join us. Let's break the legacy of here to really be that we're gonna stop the violence that's the current lynchings that is taking so many more child lives, and then secondly, that we're gonna educate our children so that they can have jobs and live out of poverty and have a sense of hope in this country. And let's get that done. If they could do what they did in their times, if the same could do what she did in her times, if Harry Tubman could do what she did, and Sojourner Truth could do what they did, what the world's wrong with us? So we can do this. So let's All right, let me ask you this. Time. So then let me ask each of you, what's your message for people who don't agree with you? The surveys show that this country is as divided <laughs> Actually, in some ways as it's ever been. No, seriously, what's you your don't message agree for people? And me? let me ask you this one. There are certain surveys that show that people would rather, there, there are more people would oppose having a son or daughter marry somebody of a different political party than of a different race. Which is a, so what's your message for people who don't agree with you? How are you going to? Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I, go ahead, it, it, is, it, it, it is about empathy in the end. So the path to empathy is different in, you know, always, right? But usually, or at least frequently, you can find that kind of path by saying, you know, what if you were born here, or what if you were, you know, just, or just getting to know each other. Part of the reason, as, as was reported after the last election, for the division in this country is between urban centers and small towns and rural places, where people in the smaller towns and rural areas, people don't know each other. In cities, you're more likely to know each other. And it's that, is the question, do we, do we know each other and can we agree? For instance, in the abortion debate, okay, that's always, you know, sort of inflammatory. But once you explain that it's not pro-abortion, it is bodily integrity, that we don't want the government to have power over our bodies, to invade our bodies, men or women, that this is I mean, right. but isn't that an 18th century Enlightenment conceit that if we all had the same facts, we'd come to the same conclusions? No, no, I don't, we, I'm we've not saying that. The, we've, we've had I'm these not facts. saying that, it's just that we can recognize each other's conclusions how, how do you and start come that, toward though? each other. How, do you, how does that start? I mean, how does that start? Well, it, uh, I mean, it, it starts by talking. I have such faith in at least, it starts by telling our stories. It's not just talking. You know, the, 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 the original form of governance, and remember democracy was invented in this country by the Iroquois Confederacy, 
the original form of govern governance was sitting in a circle and each person telling their story of that particular moment, one by one by one. And if we just practice a little democracy every day that goes like this, if we have more power than other people, try listening as much as we speak. And if we have less power, speak as much as you listen, which can be difficult because we're used to hiding. Hmm. It, 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 listening to each other's stories is the basis of everything. Hmm. There are certain basic survival needs that we must guarantee. I'm for dialogue, um, I am for talking, but I'm also for change to policy. Children should not be dying from guns. There should not be unequal education. Everybody should have health care. And so the first way we go about doing it, we organize and we vote. Everybody yes. should get out there and you vote out people who don't protect all children. None of us are safe from gun violence. I mean, none of us are safe from gun violence. That's, that's, a, that's a, secu a, a, a huge security issue. I mean, that's not about loving me or not loving me or, or, or dialogue. That's about making sure that the law is trying to keep your children safe and your family safe and you safe wherever you're going. And so there are just certain basic survival and, and, and just no other country lets its children be killed like we do. They think we're crazy, and we are crazy. We owe our children their lives. We owe them their futures. We owe them education. And again, there are not two classes of children, so that I guess I am for, and I'm, I'm a person of faith, okay, and I'm not, I try to be nonviolent, um, and we should stop corporal punishment. No, we should stop yeah. corporal punishment in schools. We should stop the violence in our juvenile justice system. We should stop the violence in our lives, and we should have these dialogues, and mm -hmm. we should talk about love, but we can also enact laws and policies and raise our voices when children are mistreated or killed or not fed or the budget cuts are going the other way. And so this is a time for a new movement to finish what Dr. King and others started and Fannie Lou Hamer and others started, and we don't have to be big dogs in doing this. I mean, I, I, I wear around my neck every day. <laughs> Every day when I get discouraged or get angry, too angry, or whatever, I have my theory of change is Harriet Tubman's and, and Sojourner Truth. And so Harriet Tubman, as you know, um, had her own underground railroad. And it wasn't about just her freeing herself. And we all have an obligation not just to free ourselves because you can't even protect your own children if you don't protect Th That is, I'm just for people who can't see, that is in fact a picture of Harriet Tubman around your no. neck there. I'm so journalist. So Where's mine? I have a bad day, I just rub <laughs> these ladies. Yeah. And you know, she created that underground railroad, but she had enough sense to go back and bring other people with mm. her and to help save other people. And she said she'd never lost a passenger in underground railroad. I don't know any airline can boast that kind of <laughs> problem. <laughs> But it was about caring about the community. It was not about just my freedom, okay? And Sojourner was something. She would get on those trolley cars in Washington, they'd put her off and she'd jump and run to the next trolley car and get back on. But her theory of change is one of my theories of change and that's what I'd like to leave with you. Say, say what my, she got hassled one night. Um, she was making a speech by an old white man who stood up and said he didn't care about her anti-slavery talk than for an old flea bite. And she snapped back at him and said, that's all right, the Lord willing, I'm going to keep you scratching. <laughs> all of us want to be, too many of us want to be big, big people. We want to have big public platforms. Enough strategic fleas can move the biggest dog. <laughs> and that's what you do. <laughs> That's how we pass most of the legislation. It's just by organizing people. It's by encouraging them to vote. It's by encouraging them to speak out. And we just need a massive flea corps for ending poverty in this country, but starting with our children. Don't make any excuses for how that's too big a thing to tackle. Just, just, just fight them. Just, just vote. Just bug them to death. Because everything depends on that. So it's not somebody else is going to cause this movement. We're going to cause this movement. If John. Lewis could do what he did, my goodness, Ms. Boynton could do what he did, and Fred Shuttlesworth, my gosh, I loved him to death. Um, if these, or, and it was, not, it was always a few people who got things done.
So this is movement time. Don't come here and celebrate this museum and the lynchings, which we should be doing, when we're letting things happen on an even greater scale of harm in some ways than were there. So let's stand on the shoulders, but let's get off the shoulders, like McGoynton said, and get out there and go to the voting booths and organize and speak out for your children and give them some freedom schools to be safe after school and in the summer. Mm -hmm. And you will change the world. I'm just, I'm just looking at Harriet Tubman, the great Harriet Tubman here, and, and remembering that she said when she was praised for freeing thousands of slaves, she always said, I could have freed thousands more if only they knew they were slaves. Okay. So I think the function of our telling stories is that we discover that it's, it's not uniquely us, it's not our fault. You know, there's three other people in the circle who had the same experience, so it, it, it's not peculiar to us if unique, different people have the same experience. It's about power, it's about politics. And therefore, I think that the, the talk and the storytelling is how we, and, and I would say that also applies to the 51% of white married women who voted for Trump because they are so accustomed to being inhabited, to thinking that everything is their husband's identity, their husband's uh, income, their husband's, and, and where is the self there? Where is the self there? Do, do you have any friends who voted for Trump, stories? either of you? Do either of you have any friends who voted for Trump? Uh, wait, I didn't hear. Do you have either of you have any friends who voted for Trump? They wouldn't dare tell me. <laughs> they wouldn't tell you. <laughs> well, I just I ac be I curious actually, about what kind of conversation. I actually you don't didn't answer have that. Friends who voted for Trump, but because you I did? travel and speak all the time, I end up talking to a lot of people who voted for Trump. And and so a guy will say to me something like, "Well, a black woman took my job," you know. And I always say to him, who said it was your job? You know, because <laughs> it's, it's the sense of entitlement. You know, it's not, it's not just that. I mean, some people voted for Obama as an outsider and voted for Trump as an outsider because they were mad at Washington. I mean, you know, there's a whole series of, of reasons. But the number one reason that people gave in public opinion polls for voting for Trump was that he was a good businessman. So, <laughs> so I always explain that some, you know, the Wall Street Journal or somebody figured out that if he had just invested the money he inherited, he would be richer than now. He is a lousy businessman. He's gone bankrupt many times. I mean, you know, so I think we, you know, we need to get a reality check out there. Does anybody get on your nerves at this point? <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> well, I just often hear people of, because um, you all are divas, our senior divas here. No, um, we're not divas. And they complain about the, uh, you know, hashtagism or hashtag activism. And they sometimes, you know, feel that the subsequent generations are more interested mm -hmm. in sort of calling things out and being heard than organizing in the way that they traditionally understand. And I just wondered if there's well, anything I, you want to... I mean, obviously, the, the web is a huge, you know, benefit. But we have to recognize it's also divisive because a lot of people don't have electricity even, much less, you know, and also, it's, uh, you can't empathize on a screen or in a book. Much as I love books, you can't empathize. You can learn, but you can't know what the other person is feeling. So, and that is certainly true. You, you don't produce oxytocin, which is the hormone that allows you to empathize and to identify. So I'm, I'm, I think we have to recognize that and hopefully get to a place where we spend as much time with each other as we do with a screen. Mm, how about you? Mm -hmm. Somebody gave me George Orwell at 19, the, uh, 1984 and the road to Wigan, Wigan Pier. And I really am a Luddite. Um, the internet has changed our world, okay? But movements don't start from the top down, they start from the bottom up. Right. And it's not right. a substitute 
for human relationships, mm -hmm. for organizing, to, for, your, for your church and your synagogue. You know, it, it's, 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 I'm, I'm terrified of the internet in many ways. There's no privacy, you, you know the kinds of things that happen in elections. And so it's not a substitute for just human will and human organizing and human relationships in your congregations, in your schools, in your community. Um, and so, you know, the, the, we, we, you know, you don't, you let people, you gotta go out and eat with people and pray with people and get to know people and build trust with people. And so I hope that you will go back home and you will think about the 10 people you know in your neighborhood or in your congregation or in your school or how you can reach out. They start from the bottom up. Um, I, there's a, there's an, I quote a lot of times, a, a strange thing came through my mailbox that it's called all the lessons you need to learn in life you can learn from Noah's Ark. <laughs> and among the six lessons was one that I loved, was to remember that the Titanic was built by experts and the Ark was built by ordinary people. <laughs> Amateur. So, you know, who were following their consciences and following God's instructions. So you get on back out there and build these arcs in your community and give these children safe spaces to come to. You know, and let's try to deal with, don't try to do stuff from the top down. That's not going to change or transform the country. You're going to change it from your human relationships and your human well, effort locally. Well, well, you've reminded me of something because I had an interview with the former Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, who actually wrote a piece in a peer-reviewed journal that said the biggest health epidemic that concerns him is loneliness. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and how I is that even possible? Do you think that. that's true? Is loneliness. Well, I what, and I think that, again, the isolation of, of technology may well be feeding into that. And I, mm. No, I think that that's a part of it. We need community. We need each other. We need to be able to, to share our sorrows and our concerns mm. and concerns. And yeah. so I, think we're, I, I think that may well, well, you know, maybe this is the greatest, wrong, Maybe this one. is the wrong group to have that conversation with because all of you are engaged. But I have to tell you, one of the things that concerns me as a journalist is how many people in the current environment and they say this to me, I don't know if other people have said this to you, is people say, oh, don't take it personally, I don't listen to the news anymore. Does anybody, have you heard, do you have friends who say that? Oh, don't take it personally, I don't want to hurt your feelings, I don't listen to the news anymore, I just tune it out, I can't take it. And I, you know, I guess maybe the, the same rule applies, you wouldn't be friends with people like that. But, um, but, but I am interested in, in your people who are checked out, I mean, who have just say, you know what, the current political dialogue, whatever it is, is assaultive, and I just want no parts of it, and I'm just checked out. And I, what, what's the, what's, what, what's the? Well, you're, you're, you're saying they're checked out of watching the news, not that they're checked out of human relationships, as far as you know, right? I'm not so, sure, I mean, I I'm mean, not sure. Not, I honestly am not sure. But That's I think, right. I mean, right. I think the major problem, uh, to, to generalize, with the news is mm -hmm. advertising because it, it measures uh, everything by the number of hits, not by the accuracy or, or the importance or whatever it is. I mean, you know, if it hadn't been for advertising, we probably wouldn't have had Trump because those dreadful shows that he was on, which were like watching a roadside accident, <laughs> got, <laughs> got uh, a lot of sponsors simply because they had numbers. And there was the guy who was at NBC, I think, who said he's bad for the country, but he's great for NBC. You know, so we, we and I notice now with the people, you know, in their 20s who I talk to, that they are not listening to, or they are very skeptical of corporate news. They have all kinds of news sources that are uh, supported by subscriptions or, or not at all, or whatever it is, you know, but I think we're in a, transition there, and it's very crucial, it, really crucial. The, you know, I mean, I feel this deeply because I got educated by women's magazines, which are controlled by the advertising. There's oceans of uh, cosmetics and clothes so they can get those ads, and fiction is gone, and poetry is gone, and, you know, Ms. got started. Actually, and Ms. started to be economically viable when we stopped taking advertising because what the readers wanted and what the advertisers want. So that, that's a big struggle, but I think we have to acknowledge it because the false news issue is so severe. My ratings are fine, just letting you know. Just, <laughs> we're down to our last, I'm just, just letting you know. But we're down to our last couple of minutes and I, 
wanted to ask each of you if, and you've done this to a, a degree throughout our conversation, but I wanted to ask if you would kind of give us each a closing thought. Um, give us a sense of what you would like to leave us with, if, if you would. I mean, you've been doing this kind of throughout, but for a lot of us, it, you know, we were just talking, you know, backstage, Gloria, that, you know, just, we've, I haven't seen you in a couple of years, and we don't, it's been one of the things that's been great about this conversation, this summit, is the opportunity for people to get together who don't have a chance to see each other, who don't have a chance mm -hmm. to talk together, and this has brought everyone together, people who have the wherewithal, who have the, you know, the physical ability, the means for whatever, to get together and to be in one place. So that's a great sort of thing. But what, in the time that we have left, I'm mm -hmm. gonna ask you to start, and then I'll give Mrs. Edelman a final, final word. Was, what, what is your closing thought to us? Do you have a charge? Do you well, have an assignment? Do you have tasks for us to do? I mean, the one thing, obviously, is stay <laughs> connected know. interpersonally. I'm tempted to quote Flo Kennedy, who always said, when asked this question, I'm for anything that's off its ass. <laughs> 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 But you know, one thing is, I mean, I think we get a case of the shoulds. You know, what should we do? Rather than doing everything we can, as you point out. You know? So the question is what we can do right now. Okay, when you are sitting here still or on your way out, you can look around and see two or three people you don't know uh, or don't know well enough, say what you're doing, what you care about. Uh, you know, you may find a new organizing revolutionary colleague, a new job, a new love affair, nobody knows what might happen. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> just to, to really to s stop worrying about should and do whatever you can. And it is such fun, you know, to figure out what if I do this, that might happen. And the, it, not doing it is the greatest punishment because then you want, failing is not the greatest punishment. Not trying is the fun, greatest punishment because then you'll always walk around in your head thinking, what if? Okay. Thank you. I want to thank everybody who's put on this earth for, for, for a reason. Everybody can make a difference. And, and I um, get up every morning and try to be half as good as Ms. May Bertha Carter or Ms. Fannie Lou Hayman, Mississippi, or Ms. Osceola McCartney, or, or you know, a washerwoman and a, a maid who left, a, 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 you know, a, her, all of her savings that she didn't need to get by on to send children to university. Um, I've seen the people who changed so much in this nation have been people who had almost nothing, but they had faith, they had a sense of justice, they wanted children to have a better life than they had and to pass on a country better than they inherited. And the folk who caused these movements, you know, and there's always a small minority, it doesn't take everybody, okay? It's been a few folk who just decided that they were gonna be out there for justice and to try to be a fair, to make us a better country and to be a, be a better so source of human beings. And I have been so blessed to have been so exposed to people who just wanted to leave a better world and who tried to live their faith. And because we're in this period, I just wanna, you know, I, I say often, I heard Dr. King when I was 19 years old in Compulsory Chapel at Spelman. I opposed Compulsory Chapel, but now I reimposed it when I became chairman of the board <laughs> because children needed to hear what we felt was important. And he often didn't know, he was, I, I knew him when he was more depressed more often than not, okay? Didn't know what the next step was gonna be. But his first speech to me in a 19-year-old in compulsory chapel was that you keep moving forward. If you can't fly, you drive. If you can't drive, you run. If you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk, you crawl. <laughs> but you keep moving forward. And that's my parting message to you is that, you know, for all of his sacrifice, don't, we can finish the job that he started, that Robert Kennedy started this Poor People's Campaign. We're gonna, he can start with children, but this must keep moving forward. Mr. Trump cannot take us backwards if we don't decide to let him. Get out there and vote, <laughs> organize, and let's move forward. And that's the only mandate I can give. Marion Wright Edelman, Gloria Steinman, thank you both. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank <laughs> you.